Okay, good morning and welcome to the 25th meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Can I please remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices? Our first item of business today is to decide whether to take items 3, 4 and 5 in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business is to take evidence on the alcohol licensing public health and criminal justice Scotland bills financial memorandum from Dr Richard Simpson, MSP. Uh, Dr Simpson is joined today by Andrew Milne of the Non-Government Bills Unit. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite Dr Simpson to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. Yeah, I think I want to begin by saying that the, the critical thing about this bill is the fact that it's designed to contribute alongside the government's uh, comprehensive strategy or, on alcohol uh, a number of measures which will improve Scotland's relationship with alcohol, which, as you know, is worse than the rest of the United Kingdom and needs to continually to be addressed. And that's why there are 10 measure, separate measures in this bill, because each one on its own uh, is, is relatively modest, but collectively, hopefully, makes us a contribution towards improving that relationship. And the most important thing, I think, in terms of this committee and the financial memorandum is the fact that any reduction in consumption will produce savings in the medium and long term. I can just give you one example uh, in relation to the uh, uh, situation in the courts, where the courts, in, the, in their evidence to you, have said there are 105,000 cases that come in front of them with alcohol problems. If we can achieve some reduction in that, then for each summary case that does not come in front of them, there will be a saving of £2,500. Perhaps more importantly, if we can reduce the numbers going to prison, and that's estimated to be about just under half of the 45,000 admissions to prisons every year, the annual savings from one prison place would be £34,000. Uh, so there are significant savings to be made, and that does not... I haven't mentioned the health service, haven't mentioned police time, haven't mentioned community safety and all the rest. These are all major savings. And it's interesting that in all the evidence that's given to you, apart from the NHS... No one has actually talked about the savings that would occur. They've all talked about the costs. Now, I accept that some of the things which are novel will have, have got a wider range of cost estimates than perhaps uh, you've been faced with in some of your other bills. Uh, but nevertheless, that is partly going to be accounted for, I hope, by the fact that we've proposed there should be uh, pilots in some of the areas so that we can estimate the cost benefits before the government proceeds. And if I can just do a little bit of history on that, when I was the Justice Minister, uh, we had already piloted DTTOs, the Drug Treatment and Testing Orders, which had failed in England in their initial test. We tested them up here, uh, making some alterations, and we made some further alterations before, as Justice Minister, I authorised the quite expensive funding of rolling out the DTTOs. So piloting is one method by which we can make a decision, or the government can make a decision as to whether, whether this should proceed. The other thing I want to say is this, that uh, in the event of a shortfall, for example, in costs to licensing boards, the licensing fees have not been raised since 2007. Even to keep them the same in real terms would be a 23% increase today because they haven't been adjusted since 2007. So that is fair enough with the economy being in the situation it was, but now the economy is expanding again. To actually increase those fees, uh, uh, I think, is something that w would be reasonable to consider. And I know that Kenny McCaskill has been... Uh, publicly suggesting that that uh, should be the case uh, with other measures. The other possible source of funding is the social responsibility levy. Now, that was in the 2010 Alcohol Etc. Scotland Act. It has never been implemented, but, of course, the government chose uh, entirely appropriately to introduce a public health levy, but they've now dropped that. And so there is no charge, uh, there is no charge in this particular field uh, if, we, if, if, if there is a successful court hearing on minimum unit pricing, and as you know, that is going back to the Scottish courts for decision, if that is decided, then the off-licences will achieve a profit with 50p minimum pricing, according to the Sheffield report, of over £100 million annually, additional profit. The, the, so there is a, is very substantial profit there, 
that uh, it could be used, for example, to adjust alcohol prices above the minimum price down, which would, in fact, reduce the effects of minimum unit pricing quite substantially. So there is an opportunity to meet the costs of my bill uh, with the social responsibility levy, and that could be introduced, because it's on the statute books now, it could well be introduced even if we don't achieve minimum unit pricing, because it would be a way of pushing the industry to uh, the retailers, particularly to increase prices. Thank you very much for that helpful introduction, uh, Richard. Uh, the way the Finance Committee works, I'm sure, like many other committees, is I will touch on some of the subject matters in the financial memorandum, and then uh, colleagues will no doubt explore in greater depth. Um, obviously, uh, we're not here to talk about the the, the, the policy objectives of the bill, but really the, the finances, and in particular in relation to the evidence that's been given to us by those who have submitted uh, that evidence. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, jump about a wee bit because obviously, as you said, it's quite a detailed bill and there's a lot of sections in it, and I'm going to focus on some of the areas of, of, of the con concerns that have been brought to our attention. So, for example, in the financial memorandum uh, in paragraph 34, which is in, in terms of the issue of container marking in terms of off-sales, um, you say that the bill doesn't prescribe how the scheme should operate. Equipment costs will depend on the type of equipment used and the scale of any scheme, so it's difficult to estimate. And you want to say it's not been possible to obtain information about these costs from previous or existing container marking schemes. So I want to know who, who you, you actually asked about that, because we've received two submissions, one uh, from the Association of Convenience Stores Licensed Grocers Federation and the Wine and Spirit Trading Association, which you'll undoubtedly have seen, who actually um, do provide some considerable details, and they obviously have raised uh, concerns about the overall cost of this, particularly to their members. Yes. I think the first thing to say about the evidence that you've been given is that there is a presumption, there are two fallacies in the presumption the first is that this is some sort of a permanent situation, and the second thing is that it is going to be extensive, and neither of those is actually correct. It will be up to the police to determine, in terms of their information gathering and their intelligence, as to which uh, licenses, which off-licenses, they wish to actually have this focused on, and for how long. I don't expect it would be something that would go on for very long at all. It, it is in a situation where, convener, we have a problem that we just do not know where proxy purchasing occurs at the moment. It's really very difficult. We also can't be certain about underage, uh, con uh, underage selling, although that has become less of a problem since the uh, testing for that has gone on. Uh, and if, if you look at the evidence from uh, Alcohol Watch, for example, in, in, in Newcastle, you'll see that the scheme has worked very well and it has not been expensive. And indeed, the licensees have welcomed it. And in one case in Newcastle, the licensee who was thought to be the source of both underage and proxy purchasing was discovered by the container marking not to be. So I would hope that this actually would be a situation in which the police, in agreement with the licensing board and with their approval, because that's required in the bill, would actually work with the licensees to introduce this. And the costs, because it is temporary, uh, would, would actually not be, uh, would not be as significant uh, as the evidence that you refer to suggested. And, but did you contact these organisations specifically for information? Um, because, I mean, the, the, the Wine and Spirit Training Association are saying this is going to cost someone in the region of £3.8 million pounds for their members. Yes, and that, I think, frankly, is absolute nonsense because it's mm -hmm. assuming that every store in Scotland would have this applied on a permanent basis. And that is just simply not the case. Uh, so the, you know, the, the costs of doing it in one license area for a very brief period of time uh, would be, you know, just, it would not be anything like that at all. It would be uh, a really very, very small amount uh, compared to what they're suggesting. Um, the, the, if you take £189 for a retailer, that is still doing it for a year. So if you say that you're going to do it for, you know, there are, what, th um, there are, I can't remember how many licenses there are in Scotland, but I think it's uh, about 1,400 or something licenses. No, anyway, the, 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 the number of licensees to which this would apply and the length of time to which it would apply would actually be very small. So the costs would not be very great. Okay, and, and, and one of the things you said in your opening statement was you talked about obviously the long-term uh, benefits, et cetera, et cetera, um, in terms of reduced costs to NHS, et cetera. 
But in terms of, um, you know, Section 3 of your bill and in paragraph 26 of the financial memorandum, you, you talk about the purpose of Section 3 is to prevent either the Scottish Ministers or Licensing Board from imposing any age-related licence conditions on a premises licence, the implication being, and this has been picked up by a number of submissions, that, uh, you know, that would mean more people are likely to drink who are younger and therefore there would be higher costs because more younger people are likely to be able to obtain alcohol and therefore more likely to be involved in the, in the criminal activities and involved in health issues um, and um, be hospitalised, etc., as a result of misuse of alcohol as a result. So what would, what would you say to, to that, Richard? Um, well, first of all, of course, the, the current law, the 2010 Act, actually does prohibit age discrimination. But subsequently to that, it was noted that the license boards could actually impose this condition, and that was the intention of Parliament in that Act, was to actually not have age discrimination. Um, but it was noted later that the actual licensing boards could do this on single licences, because the way the Act was written was that it was to stop, uh, stop an age discrimination being applied across a group of licences. So all this bit of the bill does is actually to say that you can't do it in individual licences. Having said that, it would, up, it would be up to voluntary, it would be a, the licensees could still impose a voluntary condition if they went to, themselves if they wished to do so, but the licensing boards would not be allowed to do so. So it's not going to change the situation as Parliament had intended. It's simply clarifying the law in that respect. Now, in terms of teenage uh, binge drinking, in fact, that has been going down, I'm glad to say, and the Salsus report has indicated that the drinking amongst uh, uh, 13 and 15 year olds has also been going down so the situation is improving as it is so the trend is actually in the right direction already uh, and I, this is not actually seeking to do anything which is going to suddenly open the doors it is simply going to clarify the law that was there already so suggesting that this is going to suddenly lead to a, uh, a, a, an, extra, an explosion of underage drinking is, to say the least, extremely unlikely. No, I don't think that, that suggestion has been made, but I think it, it's seen as a move in the, in the wrong direction in that regard. Well, as a policy matter, that's something which uh, the committee will want to consider. OK, now, the Royal College of General Practitioners, obviously, in their submission, um, have um, obviously uh, raised concerns regarding notification of offenders' GPs. What they've basically said is, and I quote, uh, RCGP Scotland believes that the costs and further pressure on current resources cannot be accommodated within GP practice, normal working hours, which is what you're suggesting in the FM, and they're basically saying that uh, they need significant financial support from the Scottish Government as a result. Yes, the, it, it's a very interesting reaction from the general practitioners. Having been a GP myself, convener for 30 years, the reason for introducing this clause was because in 30 years I had never been informed of any minor offence in the court involving uh, alcohol. And as you saw from my introduction, that's 105,000 cases every year. Now, at the moment, GPs are required under COF to undertake brief interventions, a highly evidenced measure, which has been very successful, and Scotland's been the first country to introduce this, uh, and that's extremely welcome. And the GPs have not uh, issued any protest about the fact that for each full-time general practitioner, they currently undertake 400 brief interventions a year. All that this measure does is tries to focus those 400 brief interventions more onto those that are getting into difficulty, and it's demonstrated in the courts that they do. Because at the moment, you, you know, the, and let, the GP may be aware of somebody having a drink problem. They may spot something in their blood tests, for example, that indicate they might have a problem. They may hear from a family member that they're having a problem. But at the moment, the one area they don't get information from is in the minor offences in courts. And that's what this measure is designed to do. It will not add to the workload. It will focus the workload now, the only area in which the GP evidence is of some merit, I think, is in the fact that they suggest that this, this will have to be recorded in the notes. But hopefully we're moving to a situation of electronic transfer. Uh, we certainly are in, in the health service, and I see no reason why this could not be introduced at a point where electronic transfer becomes possible. Uh, and that will make it very easy, and it'll get transferred straight in, into, the GP, into the GP record. Uh, so it then doesn't become a matter of, of, of recording. 
Okay, let's touch on another couple of points before we open up uh, to the rest of the committee. Uh, in its submission, um, NHS Great in Glasgow uh, and Clyde say, uh, I'm going to give you some quotes here, there's very little detail on the financial impact on the NHS. Uh, the removal of age discrimination for officers could potentially result in the cost of the NHS if it resulted in more teenagers requiring medical treatment, which we've already touched on. Uh, there is insufficient information on the alcohol education policy. There's a lack of clarity in the form or delivery of alcohol awareness training. Uh, um, all of the costs would require to be met first before any potential savings could be realised. Uh, it should be clear there's a lack of clarity as far as funding is concerned. The financial impact cannot be properly assessed without further information, and it appears that the costs and timescales over which they would be expected have not been properly thought through. Yes, I think the, the, the comments are, are quite uh, detailed and, and in some respects quite harsh. I did say in the introduction that some of the things are quite difficult. Uh, to cost, and that's why I've recommended piloting in some of the areas. Uh, for example, uh, we, we know that uh, from the uh, from the Fife uh, um, Alcohol and Drug Partnership, who already run an education program, that the cost per patient, uh, even including the coordination costs, are, are 35 pounds per patient. Uh, if you take out the coordination costs, the costs are only £17 per patient. Convener, I have to say to you, as a doctor, if somebody offered me a treatment which actually was only £17 and had a 34% response rate in the field of addictions, because I was also a consultant psychiatrist in addictions, if someone offered me that, I'd, I'd bite their hand off for it. So actually suggesting that they, the costs are not there in terms of the education side, I think is not valid. Uh, it has been costed in there. However, I have suggested that that is in a, a relatively rural se setting in the Kingdom of Fife, and I suggested that an urban pilot should be undertaken in order to see precisely what Glasgow are calling for, which is a more detailed costing before this is spread out across the country. So I think that, 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 that deals with that. I think as far as the rest is concerned, hopefully we'll deal with them in, in the detailed questioning, but uh, some of the, uh, some of the uh, areas which have been suggested as costing uh, a lot of money actually uh, are not going to cost uh, really nearly as much as is being suggested. Um, there are definitely costs involved, but if you place that against the fact that the Scottish society is that the, the, the harms that are, are in the Scottish society across the whole area are £4.5 billion, pounds, then spending some money on this is, is not an unreasonable thing to do. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can understand a lot of what you're saying in terms of the the the, the, the policy um, ideal, and um, I'm certainly uh, very much in favour of what the policy, um, you know, um, you know, um, direction is. But we're obviously here to interrogate the financial memorandum, and I think you know it's the accuracy of that, obviously, which is a matter of, of concern that's been raised by uh, those giving evidence. I mean, Aberdeenshire Council said there's not enough details being provided in, uh, in relation to actual costings, um, and uh, you know, uh, North Ayrshire Council said that, uh, that you know the costings have not been taken into proper consideration, and ca the impact cannot be quantified. It imposes further demands on the licensing board through the implications of the bill, which will be a further burden on the council uh, and um, you know when asked what future costs would be since it's not possible to quantify these at present any financial impact is dependent upon volumes of cases arriving which cannot be accurately predicted so I think the, the issue there isn't what the what you're trying to achieve with this bill in terms of policy it's obviously the kind of uh, the financial implications here about, and now yeah we are talking about relatively small costs if you take a 23 percent increase in the licensing fee for example which would be as I indicated in my introduction, the, the increase just to bring it back to the real terms level of fees, th there is not a 23% increase in the cost to the licensing boards within this bill, even at its higher le end of the range of the costings that we've provided, that that would not be the case. We have done, made a very serious attempt uh, with, in our methodology of providing as much costing as we've been able to do. But because some of these things are innovative, it is inevitable that we can't actually give the, uh, a full costing on it. But we're not talking about millions and millions of pounds here. Uh, we're talking about a fraction of the additional profits that the, uh, the off-licenses are going to get from uh, minimum unit pricing. So we're talking about a minimal cost. And actually, even without the social responsibility levy, the licensing board increase of 23% to bring it back to real terms would more than pay for everything in this bill.
Okay. And just lastly, before I, I let um, first colleague in, is just um, in terms of the you know, the submission from the advertising association. Uh, they've obviously talked about the loss of revenue uh, in terms of the 2.73 uh, million um, spent on alcohol advertising outdoors, which they say uh, could lead to the loss of up to uh, 300 jobs, say 308 currently working in that sector. What, what would you say to that? Well, I think it's very interesting that they haven't actually given any quantifiable amount from the voluntary ban. Uh, members may be aware of the fact that there is currently a voluntary 100-metre ban. It is being broken, and indeed there has now been a court case in Wales because that has been broken. It is being broken at the moment. It's not being uh, properly enforced because it is obviously a voluntary ban, and you know what can you do about it because it's not, it's not something you can... If there are statutory fines, as I'm proposing, then you can actually impose it, but you can't impose it if it's a voluntary ban. But what they don't say is how many jobs were lost as a result of the imposition of this voluntary ban. Now, the other thing is that actually the advertising that I'm proposing to control is relatively limited because of the powers that we have. If we were imposing the full loi Evin, which they did in France, then uh, there would be considerable costs in temporarily to the industry. But I have to tell you, convener, that the advertising industry in, in France is alive and well and, and not having any problems, and yet they have a complete ban on alcohol advertising, including sports, sponsorship, everything. So you cannot advertise alcohol in France at all, uh, and yet the advertising industry is actually in, in, in good health. Billboard and fixed-place advertising in two, within 200 metres only adds 100 metres to the current voluntary ban, but also billboard and uh, public advertising is actually a very small part of the advertising that is going on now. The main thing which I have not been able to tackle, and, we'll, the, and this parliament will have to come back to, is social media. That is where the biggest expansion is occurring. And if the advertising industry are telling me that they're still totally fixed on fixed place advertising, then I would say that that is uh, astonishing because that is the area that is declining most rapidly in terms of the advertising. So you're saying that this, these uh, 300 jobs you believe is, is spurious because you've, you've also commented that, uh, you know, that you believe that uh, something, something else will simply be found to replace these hoardings in terms of products if the alcohol is removed. Is there any evidence for that? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yes. You've suggested basically that, uh, that the, if alcohol uh, advertising is removed from billboards, etc., they'll simply find something else to advertise. So, are you saying uh, that have you any evidence that that is the case? And also, are you saying that the, the, the job losses that may occur, which do seem high, I have to say, in the advertising association, uh, sorry, uh, would be um, are spurious? So it's okay. I, I think that they are largely spurious. I mean, the advertising industry, like all industries, go through, goes through its ups and downs depending on the economy. But, there's, there, you know, you don't see a lot of empty billboard spaces within 100 metres of schools. You just don't see it. So, actually, they fill it with other advertising. So, you know, it's... it's, it's but that's anecdotal, I take it, that you've known... It, 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 it's, so. it's, it's anecdotal because this ban, this voluntary ban has only been in for a short time, so things have only been removed, uh, you know, relatively recently. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the, certainly when I look around, the, the schools in my constituency, uh, there are not hundreds of empty billboard spaces in those areas. OK. Let's open out the session then. The first colleague to ask questions will be marked and followed by Jean. Th thank you, Commissioner. I just wanted to, to look at the, the, the table on page 42 of the financial memorandum, the summary table of costs. Um, I guess, it, uh, to, to use the kind of Rumsfeld language, there, are, there appear to be known knowns and known unknowns and unknown unknowns uh, contained within it. But one of the um, things that I found quite striking is you've totaled quantified costs only, but within the unquantified costs, particular one that leaps out is caffeinated alcohol, um, significant unquantified savings, which obviously would have an impact uh, on some of the other costs that are being associated. Have you, uh, when you say significant but unquantified, how, how do you justify saying significant if you can't quantify those? Well, it, it, the situation is that we don't know from the research that was done in Strathclyde, and this is mainly a Strathclyde problem. What we don't know is the number of uh, the number of cases that led to conviction. For example, there were 144 incidents during the period of the research in which uh, the bottles involved with this particular product 
uh, caffeine mixed drinks were used in assaults. So how many of those would not be and how many you know, would be switched to other bottles is, is, is uncertain, but there would be some saving in that the number of offenses involving that particular product uh, were uh, estimated at 5,000 during the period of the research. So there were, if there were 5,000 cases uh, associated with that, then it would be reduced. The unquantified bit is we don't know how much switching there would be to other products. This, well, is, a fa yeah. this is a really interesting <coughs> area because it, 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 it's a culture that's confined to the west of Scotland. You do not find that uh, the, the, the cases of people being convicted and sent to the Young Offenders Unit having drunk this particular caffeine, uh, caffeine alcohol mix, uh, you don't find them coming from the east or from the north. Uh, they tend to, to drink whiskey and they tend to drink uh, uh, vodka uh, and uh, cheap cider are the main drinks that the young people use. Uh, now, the levels of violence in these areas in young people associated with alcohol is less. It is less, uh, you know, according to the uh, Strathclyde Police. So, you know, th there is something going on with the caffeine-related drinks, uh, which actually, you know, hopefully would be less if you don't have caffeine in, in your drink. A big problem, Mr. McDonald, is the fact that caffeine is a stimulant, alcohol is a depressant. Now, uh, the, s some young people, you know, you will get aroused and aggressive with alcohol before they become depressed and sedated. Uh, but if you have caffeine as well, that, that tra trajectory is continued for, for much longer. And that's why caffeine is a problem. It produces what's called wired awake drunks who continue to drink because they think they aren't drunk uh, and they, they, they can become uh, quite aggressive. So, you know, it is difficult. The costings, which is what we're here to talk about today, we said it was unquantified because I just didn't want to say, oh, this will reduce it by 10% or whatever, because I think that would be unreasonable to do so because we don't know what cultural change there would be if we actually managed to reduce the amount of caffeine in, in the drinks. I, I, I appreciate that. I mean, one of the arguments that's been put is that there, there, there would be nothing to prevent, for example, uh, the mixing of high-energy drinks into spirits such as vodka, which would create a similar effect um, as the one that you've described. And so the question I have is, uh, on a number of these boxes, you've put unquantified. On others, you've put some but unquantified. And then specifically there, you've put significant but unquantified. And I'm just wondering why you've drawn those distinctions rather than simply putting unquantified, because it, it, it gives a, a, a leading impression um, of, of where, where these things might go. And I just wonder why you, you chose to make those distinctions rather than to simply say that the costs or savings were unquantified across all of the boxes. Well, I think the, if we take the restrictions on advertising, for example, there will be some uh, costs, from, uh, there will be some costs uh, associated with, with actually policing that, uh, that advertising. But we've no idea how much because we don't know you know, how much that will be followed. Now, if you take the ban on smoking as an example, uh, the costs on that were difficult to, to determine at the time because we didn't know how many people would actually continue to smoke in public places. It's turned out, as actually many of us expected, that Scots are really pretty law-abiding and therefore the costs associated with it were very small, but they were some but unquantified at the time. So I think saying some means yes there has to be policing of it mm. but whether there will be additional costs of taking it to court uh, etc you know whether there will be uh, imposing fixed penalty fines etc how much that will be is really yeah. quite uncertain it, it, it just strikes me that you've used kind of three definitions of unquantified if yeah. you will you've got just unquantified which doesn't have any commentary attached uh, some but unquantified and then significant but unquantified so are you saying where where you've put unquantified without either some or significant we're talking essentially minimal but unquantified in those yes. areas yes okay. I, I expect i mean for example the alcohol education policy statement is obviously going to involve some some civil service time once in a parliament if it's passed because it requires the government to produce a statement for Parliament. It will require ministers to appear in front of a committee uh, or, or in the Parliament uh, to, to explain their policy and be questioned on it. Uh, so there is some time involved in that. But it's really 
you know, part of the general process of, of this Parliament's scrutiny of education policy. So it's merely saying what probably should be going on anyway, uh, and the, the costs involved really are, 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 not, are not significant at all. But we put some in where we did realise there would be we definitely would be some costs involved. I mean, uh, obviously, the conveners touched on a number of the submissions, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on a couple of them as well, where there has been some um, suggestion that the financial implications or, or where it says minimal or, or, or otherwise, perhaps they don't see that as being the case. I mean, uh, Aberdeenshire Council suggests that um, the impact of informing and updating all licence holders, it would be unfair to suggest that as a minor administration cost because each local authority will have differing numbers of license holders creating differential impact on budgets in different areas. So do you think it's fair enough to make that kind of broad brush assess? Because for ex presumably it will cost less in Clack Manninshire than it will in Glasgow, for example. And, and do you feel that that's a, a fair assessment to have made? And of course, they'll have different levels of income well, as well, because they'll have different number of licenses. But West Lothian's made the same point that all all licences would require to be updated with changes. I have to say to you, the government have changed the mandatory conditions on a number of occasions, and there has been no publicity, there has been no comment by the licensing boards that have said that this is a major problem. So I think that you know, the, the fact that they, they're, they're, they're putting this in as evidence on a private member's bill is really interesting, that they didn't do that, they didn't protest when the mandatory, when the regulations were changed to the government. There was no protest to the a relevant subordinate legislation committee. Can I also add this fact that I checked this out because I was, I was concerned genuinely that they would have to reissue uh, all the licenses uh, with the changes that I proposed. And I have a comment which I, I've been permitted to quote from the chairman of the largest licensing board in Scotland, um, which, uh, which says uh, uh, as follows. I don't believe that providing all licenses holders with a copy of any amended or updated mandatory license condition is an unduly onerous task, as it is, in effect, a mail shot. I don't think it's necessary for the entire license to be reprinted. In my view, an addendum with the new or amended conditions would be sufficient. There are already other requirements within the Act to carry out mail shots to all license holders. For example, the annual fee reminder letters in relation to any general extension of license hours granted for events of national significance. In my view, West Lothian's argument, if it were to succeed, would, in, would mean would, uh, licensing law would become entirely static and there would never be any changes to the mandatory conditions. As the 2005 Act removed the license requirement for licenses to be renewed, I think it is always intended that the mandatory conditions set out in legislation would continue to be reviewed and updated to deal with emergency licensing issues and concerns. Now, if the biggest licensing authority is saying that, I think that you know, they, you know, Aberdeen and West Lothian perhaps are, are, are protesting overly in terms of the requirements that would be placed on them they are not as on onerous as is being suggested in the evidence that's been given to you. Okay. I, I know also in the, the West Lothian submission, which you've alluded to, um, you'd spoken about the container marking scheme and your feeling that there, there would be minimal cost to this. They've highlighted the, um, the potential that, for example, if it were to involve uh, major supermarket chains, that would obviously have a differential cost compared to the, the corner shop given the, the number of products that would be being stocked within store. Um, and they say the council does not recognise that such costs are likely to be minimal or accommodated within existing licence fees. Do you recognise that concern? Um, I think that the majority of the costs will fall actually on, on the licensee, not on the, not on the licensing board. The licensing board is merely giving permission for this scheme to be uh, implemented on the requests of the police. So... Uh, the costs to the licensing board of agreeing, agreeing to this to do it is, is, is not really highly significant. They're not going to go in and mark every bottle uh, in, in, in the supermarket. That will be a matter for the licensee to do it. Uh, the, in terms of the, the supermarkets, they are actually pretty good about making sure that there isn't underage selling. So uh, uh, in respect of the underage selling element, they're unlikely to be ones that are being asked to do this. Uh, in terms of the of the proxy se selling, I think that is a different matter. And there will be or could be uh, some costs to the supermarkets of this. But remember, it is temporary. And I think, again, the evidence that's been given to you it makes the assumption that this is some sort of long-term permanent situation. To market 
uh, for a week or two weeks uh, is not going to be very significant. Can I just say one more thing, Mr. McDonald, before you come back in? And that is, unlike the small stores where you know, they will maybe have to do it with a, a, a specific marker pen, it would be possible for the supermarkets who already know exactly what you purchase as an individual, uh, they, and they know that it's their store, it would be possible for them to actually amend their barcoding system uh, to do this. Uh, and I'm, I don't think it would be that difficult to know that these things come from the store. I suspect that they, uh, they already do so, but I haven't had a response from them on that basis. But, but presumably, though, if it is made a condition, even a temporary condition of license for, for there to be container marking, there's also a, an, ins a, an inspection element to that that could arise where if a complaint were raised that uh, a store which had had container marking um, placed on it as a condition was not following through on that, that would need to be checked presumably by trading standards? Yes, if there was a complaint. Uh, but I, I don't, as, as I'm hoping that the police would be discussing with the licensees in the way that Alcohol Watch does in, in, in Newcastle, uh, a, having a general agreement to this, uh, and that you know, would make it relatively simple and straightforward. Um, I don't think that um, it would be a major problem. A couple more questions, if I could, Convener. Um, the Police Scotland submission goes into some depth around the fixed penalty offences and the potential for... Uh, changes to existing systems to be made because of the need to communicate these with local authorities. Um, and they say then, um, when it comes to the estimated costs and savings, uh, as detailed above, there may be significant additional costs not incorporated in the financial memorandum. And then they say it cannot be gauged at this stage what the financial implications will be for Police Scotland or how these costs should be met. I mean, obviously, you will contend that these costs will be minimal. However, if it were to transpire that there were to be substantial costs, that would obviously be, you know, there would need to be funding found from somewhere to pay for that, wouldn't there? There would indeed, but the, the fixed penalties actually do change. So the paperwork associated with all fixed penalties actually has to be upgraded from time to time. And I would expect the government to do that in consultation with the uh, 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 the Scottish Police Chief, to determine at what point this would be actually the most appropriate point to do it. And that would be when other changes are being made uh, to, to the fixed penalties. So you know, I think the timing of that would actually ameliorate any costs that we, would be involved. Obviously, there are a number of fixed penalty uh, requirements which existed for, for police in some parts of Scotland, but had been taken into local authorities uh, across Scotland in a number of areas. So... Um, is there is there a concern that having the police administering it in all areas um, may may create additional burdens for the police? Mm. Um, I, I don't think so because they, they they're already issuing fixed penalty notices involving alcohol. They're already doing that. The change that we're proposing is to actually allow for that to be. Uh, um, not paid if you go into an alcohol awareness training and you know they're already doing it in fife and fife police have not made any didn't make any comment on on the problems that they were faced with in this so i don't think that it's a major issue just the final question then on the fife pilot i note the evidence from the angus alcohol and drugs partnership um and they've highlighted the evidence in the, well, the, the financial memorandum paragraph 103 i think it is what it talks about the 34% course completions and they question whether that that essentially whether that is reasonable in relation to an investment of around £39,000 but also how this compares to other court disposals. Do you have any evidence in relation to that that would suggest that that is the most appropriate me uh, mechanism or uh, compared to other court disposals? Well, as, as I think I've indicated to you already, the cost per individual is either 35 I think it is, £35 each or £17 each. This is a very, very cheap programme. Can I just give you the figures, though? There were 2,947 referrals with 1,004 people attending. This is from uh, in, in a period from April 2012 to June 2014 in Fife. 2,947 referrals, 1,004 attending. So that's a 34% attendance rate, um, which is 
you know, quite a significant number, 1,004. Now, if some of those then cease drinking, and the indications are that it was successful in, in reducing the uh, re-offending rate for that group, then, in fact, the savings to that alcohol and drug partnership are significant. Because otherwise, if they go on re-offending, they then progress. This whole thing is about tackling a lot of the less significant group before they get into the point of being alcohol dependent, where they require you know, full addiction management of the sort that I was undertaking as a doctor. It is actually tacking people at an early stage and saying, look, you may have an alcohol problem. Do you really understand what alcohol can do? This is a substance which you must take seriously. We will offer you the opportunity, instead of paying a fine, to, uh, to go and uh, have an alcohol awareness, because we know that for some people that actually will change their attitude to alcohol. And that's what we're trying to achieve. So the costs involved are actually very small. With, within an ADP budget, it, it really is very small. We're talking about, again, a £40 million budget in alcohol, a really very substantial amount of money being spent in this area. So you know, big sums uh, in terms of the expenditure. Uh, this uh, 39000 for Fife, uh, and that's the, the maximum cost. It's actually only, uh, I think, uh, it's, uh, of, of that... 20,000 was for the coordinators. So if you actually remove the coordinators, which are probably not actually needed in every case, then you're talking about a cost of 19,000 for Fife. The total cost across Scotland within an ADP budget is really very small. Anything which makes the system more effective is what I'm really about and trying to achieve. Okay. Okay, Jean. Thank you. Uh, just a, a couple of questions. Now, following on from that last statement, I mean, there are already a number of other programmes. It's not only the Fife pilot that is about rehabilitation and um, warning people programmes to try and reduce alcohol intake or, or stop it altogether. I mean, that's not a new thing. No, there, there, are, there are a lot of problems. There are a lot of, a lot of programmes. Uh, one that I introduced in West Lothian when I was uh, the lead consultant there was arrest referral, which is a, a very important measure. Now, actually, we only have that in five of the sheriffdoms. And it was originally going to be in my bill. I withdrew it because the government undertook to ensure that this was spread to the other sheriffdoms. You know, we are fantastic in Scotland about initiatives. We're really good about developing new things. But we don't always actually ensure that every area is undertaking them. What I'm trying to do here is use a scheme, which is a small pilot in one area, suggest that we have another pilot in an urban area in order to determine the cost benefits. And if the cost benefits actually match what's occurred in Fife, and I, well, I can't say I'm entirely confident, but I'm reasonably confident that if it was piloted in Dundee or, or Aberdeen or Glasgow, that actually the savings would be even greater because the problems are, being, are even greater. So it's about spreading out those schemes. This is one particular scheme I accept, Ms. Uh, um, that it is just one scheme out of many. But all schemes that work should be actually spread out, in my view. I would agree with that. It's just, uh, I suppose, in terms of, of your bill, there's, uh, that we're being quite specific about that, but some of these costs, as it were, are, are already there, and there may, there may be more successful programmes. I mean, I, I'm just not quite sure of its relevance in a sense, in that not that it's not relevant, of course they are, and, and many of them very good, but it, using it in, in particular in, your, in the financial memorandum, that's all. The thing is that we have an, an enormous number of different routes into treatment, uh, from you know, the High Court uh, right through to the police making a suggestion that the person that they'd picked up at night should, you know, and taken home or, or put into a taxi scheme or sent to the uh, uh, street pastors, that they will, all, they will all make these suggestions that they should go into treatment. They will all signpost. This is simply another signposting. We need to have as many effective services as we have. This is an effective service that, in my view, needs to be rolled out. Okay. And um, m my question was, you mentioned earlier on in, in evidence uh, that licensees' fees could be increased by 23%. You were quite specific about that. Um, to yeah, that's inflation. One pound in 2007 is worth one pound 23. Uh, the real terms is one pound 23 today. You just need to go to, a, I think it's an, under an inflation indicator. Yeah, we got that information from uh, online inflation calculators. Right. 
But I think at the, at the last change in, uh, I'm right in saying at the last change in, in uh, licenses and issuing licenses, there came with that obligations on all of the licensees to introduce training programs for staff and a lot of other costs. And I wondered if you've considered that in, in terms of looking at the, the, the real cost of getting a license uh, for any, any business. Because I it's not I only the cost of paying yeah, for a license. I, it, I don't think there's anything in my bill that's going to change that from the no. licensee's point of view. I mean, if you take, for example, if you take volume discounting. Well, what my point, uh, Dr. Simpson, is, is that it's, not on, it's no longer. There was a day when you applied for a license and were proved to be of good character and you got a license to sell alcohol. That's no longer the case. Uh, we don't do that anymore. There is a license issued. But the, but the introduction of a training program and evidence that you, that you uh, can hold a license uh, are not without cost. In fact, they're much more costly on an annual basis to businesses, and I wonder if you've taken that into consideration when you apply inflation. Oh, only, I see, when, when you apply inflation. But the, the actual license fees came in, the new license fees came in in 2007 with the new bill, and with the new obligations in 2007. Which you would also have to increase the cost to the business. I'm just... At that time? No, no. If you're going to increase... In, uh, apply I, 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 inflation... You've lost me completely, Ms. Urquhart. If, okay. if the licensing bill, um, which I have to say I was originally responsible for setting up the commission that led to it, and we knew that it was going to in involve considerable costs, but the licensing bill was 2005, the new licensing fees came in in 2007, they have not altered since 2007, and although there have been some additional mandatory conditions, they have not significantly altered the original licensing act. Therefore, the conditions you refer to about training, etc., 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 actually haven't changed since 2005, uh, or rather since 2007. So there have been no additional costs. There have been no additional costs since 2007, and indeed, because the, the requirement to renew licenses was dropped, that was, an, that was a considerable offsetting. Because if, if you have to apply for renewal of license every so often, as they do in many countries, they have to apply for a renewal every three years, you know, that really would be a significant cost. But there have been no additional significant costs since 2007. So I think the 23% increase is merely a reflection of the, of the fact that the, 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 the industry has actually made some savings in this particular area. We're talking about £189 to £900 per licence, by the way. So again, we're not talking about thousands of pounds here. We're talking about relatively small costs, but uh, you know, the overall increase in the total licence fee would be 23%. Yeah. Well, I, I just re re repeat my, my, my point finally, is that the additional costs of the licence, the, the fact that the, 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 the cost of the licence was... Uh, and, and not applying for it was indeed a saving. You're absolutely right. But the additional burden in order to hold that licence is becoming increasingly expensive in terms of, of training and so on that businesses for are new obliged licenses. to do in order to have a licence. For new licences. Well, no, you have to keep that up. You can't, you can't, you can't uh, stop training staff. You've got to do that. That's not a one-off cost. It's a, a, a continual cost to any... License holder. Ah, yes, I understand. I can't, yeah. I can't give you the costs, uh, no, relative I'm costs of training that, that in terms of the license fee application. But I, what I will say that... It might be a bit simplistic to say that only applying inflation is the, the only cost that's going to be applicable. It won't be. I, I understand now the point you're trying to make. And I, I agree that, of course, the training costs will have risen, but the, uh, the, the cost of the license has not actually risen. So, therefore, uh, for a new license... You're getting it at the same price as 2007. Uh, the cost of training may have gone up slightly, but I, I suspect that that's something that should have been being done by licensees anyway. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Can follow by Jackie. Um, yeah, can I refer you to the last page of the financial memorandum, which is also described as the summary table of costs? Uh, Mr. McDonald asked a few questions on this table already, but I just want to ask a few more. I'm trying to work out roughly what you think the cost will be in local authorities. Um, 
And when you get to the bottom of that table, you've got £87,000 start-up costs up to £810,000 per annum. But that appears to spread across local authorities and uh, what are described as costs on others. Um, now, that obviously reflects the fact that at a couple of other points in the table, you've given a cost across the two as opposed to individually. Is, is there any way of working out at what the costs are on local authorities separately from what the costs are on others, or can you only do it by mixing the two together? Well, I think that the, the, if, if you take the alcohol awareness training, which is the, you know, the, the big cost, as it were, that's £570,000, and that does involve health boards at local authorities and police. Uh, it is actually the alcohol drug partnerships who would be in charge of dealing with that. And, of course, th these things are all being... They are now local authority-based, but they're actually more of a health... They're, they're, a, they're a, the a line in the health board uh, expenditure, although it's devolved from the centre under the health budget. So um, if you take the 570,000 out, then you're left with roughly £300,000 cost to the total cost to the local authorities in a budget of 12 billion pounds okay i mean i wasn't i wasn't complaining about the cost i was just trying to get get yeah. for, for the sake of accuracy yep. Yep. so so your your view is in terms of the financial memo the cost to local authorities would be about three hundred thousand. that's an absolute maximum because that's even sure. some of those under the drink banning orders for example that would be the police uh, that would be uh, would have a cost on that and you know the, the, their share of that would be there would be a bit, bit there as well um, on, on the community involvement side, that's the main one that would cost. Uh, and I think there have been some concerns expressed about that, uh, that they, they involving the communities who do not have a community council, which I'm very keen on because they are mostly in the deprived areas that don't have it. And that's the areas of greatest density of pubs, uh, particularly, and of off-licences. So it's an area I'm very keen on. But that, the hundred, that 180,000 is... Uh, I think, you know, sort of some significance. Sure. Okay. But, I mean, again, if you, if you focus on that 180,000, then, is is that a cost on local authorities or is that a cost on local authorities and others? Because the way it's set out in the table, it seems to cover both columns. So I'm just trying to get clarity on how much of that is local authorities. Well, the licensee is obviously involved as well. This is about informing the, informing the community. At the moment, they inform the community councils and they're required... If, if there isn't a community... Well, they're also required to inform people within four metres of the proposed licence. And it seemed to me that where there is no community council, four metres is inadequate. So what I'm proposing is 50 metres. Now, it may be, having seen the evidence come in, that, that the Finance Committee may wish to look at that closely. They, they might may wish to propose a slightly reduced area, and I wouldn't object to... To that happening, I think maybe 50 metres. If you take it as, if I remember my maths, two pi r uh, for the for the uh, square meterage, it does become a pretty significant area for 50 metres. So it may be that it should be it should be 40 or 30. But the the principle of the proposal is that community councils should be consulted properly, and I think local authorities have a duty to do that. And if that costs, you know, it would be less than 180k if it's a reduced area. But I think that there, there are some costs, I admit, yeah. in that area, which I think are, are worthwhile. But with the current situation with local authorities, it may be that that should, area should be curtailed. It should be reduced slightly. OK. And last question, then, just, uh, again, just for the sake of clarity, there are sort of probably eight or nine boxes in that table where you use the word minimal. Um, I mean, is there any? Is there any definite? Have you used any specific definition? There is it under a thousand. Is it under ten thousand? Or is it is it impossible to to see? Yeah. Could I ask Andrew to? Yeah, sure. I think the th the thing to emphasise in relation to this table is that it is a summary of the information set out in all the earlier paragraphs of the memorandum. So when we were preparing the table, it was done at the end of the process, and it was meant to capture in sort of at a glance form the information that's already set out earlier. So you really need to refer back to the individual uh, descriptions to uh, see what's behind what's in the boxes. Uh, and obviously, in order to produce a table that was going to fit on one page, we had to use pretty concise terms. 
Um, so, for example, where you were asking earlier about boxes that spread across more than one column, that is simply where in the text you will see that there's some expressed uncertainty about exactly where costs would fall depending on how what arrangements are arrived at in practice. So it reflects the text. And the same is true um, in relation to um, the use of terms such as minimal or unquantified. It, it simply reflects what's in the text where we've tried to indicate uh, a recognition that there will be some cost, uh, but we expect it to be small, for example. And different forms of words are used in the different paragraphs. We've tried to use more consistent terminology in the table just for the sake of brevity. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Uh, Jackie, to be followed by Joan. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, just a quick question. I, I recognise and very much welcome Section 2 of the bill that deals with caffeinated alcohol. Um, and I see you've gone for the proportionate approach of varying the amount rather than, rather than an outright ban, which is um, easily achieved. Um, I wonder whether you could talk us through some more of the costings, because whilst I recognise that there will be savings in terms of you know, the prison service and police, um, I recollect a survey suggesting that more than half of the broken glass in Strathclyde was as a result of one particular brand of caffeinated alcohol. So, you know, there would be additional savings to local authorities there as well, one would have thought. There are indeed. And, and as, as the member will know, we did endeavour to persuade the producer to move to plastic bottles, which would not only reduce the, the waste somewhat, but it would also, more importantly, reduce the number of occasions on which these particular bottles are used as a weapon. Uh, successfully. I mean, they could use a plastic bottle, but it would be a, a, good, deal, a good deal less damaging. Uh, so, yes, there are additional savings to be made, I suspect, from doing this. It is a real problem in that this is a cultural issue, and to try and actually legislate for what is a cultural issue is very difficult. The, the reason why I chose, for example, to make it a not an outright ban uh, or a specific limitation, as they have done in Denmark, uh, by the way, there is... There isn't an outright ban in America, uh, as has been, uh, I have been attacked for suggesting that. I have never suggested there was an outright ban. What happened in America was the Food and Drug Administration said to the producers, you will have to prove that your product is safe. And the producers took one look at that and said, uh, we, we really can't do that, and they stopped producing it, which is a really interesting way of moving. It may be the food standard Scotland will be the route that that might, if this doesn't pass, that that might be the route to achieve it. But there, there are obviously costs to the producer. But we know, for example, they produce a different level of caffeine in Ireland to in Scotland. So again, it's perfectly possible for the producer of this particular product to vary the quantity of caffeine in their drug as well. Because the evidence in Scotland is not as clear as it is in America, uh, and the American evidence is related more to college students than it is to uh, those in the west of Scotland who indulge in violent, drunken behaviour, uh, the, the, the evidence here is slightly different. It's related to the criminality. We don't have as much evidence about the direct effects on the brain, for example, of the caffeine-alcohol mix in a Scottish context. And that's why... I, I, have changed the, the proposal from one of a specific ban at 150, which is the Danish level, to saying that the minister will be able to introduce it at the level that they want. So that, again, of course, makes the costs uh, also a little less easy to quantify. You, you, you rightly made the point um, in earlier discussion on, on the financial memorandum that actually there are potentially savings to be generated, not just in this area, but across the board as a cumulative effect of the bill. Um, I'm curious to know when you think they would start, because you know, cultural change perhaps takes a generation. Um, so are we looking at 10 years, 20 years? You know, when do you think we'll start to see savings, and at what kind of level? I think MISAS, which is the monitoring body, which uh, I know the government, in answer to a question I've tabled recently, have said they're looking at whether they're going to, going to continue that monitoring and how. One of their difficulties is actually to determine what, what is the cause and effect of different measures. And so what this bill is designed to do is to support the government's measures in moving forward on a whole range of issues uh, in a sort of salami cuts tactic that will continue the process that began with the Licensing Act in 2005. Colleagues will remember that up until 2005, the consumption of alcohol in Scotland was rising. 
from 2005 on, even the Licensing Act, before it was fully implemented, began to be associated, if not the cause, of a reduction in the consumption in Scotland. And consumption has gone on reducing until this last 18 months, uh, which is, means that there has been a change. The, the levels of hazardous drinking have come down by 6%, from the, the, just under 30% to just over 20%. So the, there is a change occurring, and I think my bill, uh, with its relatively modest costs, will in fact continue the process of making the cultural shift that we're seeing already. We need to keep that impetus up. I have to say, regrettably, of course, the Alistair Darling uh, uh, escalator on duty was abandoned by the coalition government and the current government, uh, and that that has seen already a reversal in the consumption of alcohol in Scotland, which I regard as highly dangerous. Uh, price is obviously a very important factor. So, you know, we, we, we have difficulty in associating cause and effect, but all these measures will contribute. And this particular one of caffeine that you're talking about will undoubtedly, I think, contribute to a shift in culture. Where that culture will shift to is a matter of speculation. Thank you. John. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, I mean, probably just to follow up one or two points that have already been made. Um, on, the, on the alcoholic drinks containing caffeine section two, and it's page 25 of the um, financial memorandum, I just wonder if you could clarify a little bit, because at one point it says in paragraph 21, uh, sales of this type of drink account for a very small percentage of all alcohol sales. And yet in the following paragraph 22, it says uh, that 43.4% of those questioned in prison who had admitted drinking uh, had been drinking that particular type, which sounds quite a lot to me. Um, can you just clarify around that? Well, we should remember the numbers going to the young offenders prison, and this is the most of it, is actually quite low. And it has also gone down. So we're talking about a, a relatively small number of which 43% is the percentage. Uh, the, 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 the total alcohol consumption in Scotland, uh, the amount that the premixed caffeine alcohol drinks account for is really quite small. So as a total, it is not great. This is why I don't know if you've read any of the other evidence, but the, the uh, Al um, SHAP, which is the organization on alcohol uh, problems, uh, represented by Dr. Peter Rice, who's one of our foremost addiction specialists, a colleague of mine, uh, said that this was not a priority for them, this area. Well, uh, to, with due respect to Dr. Rice, he comes from the Dundee area. And if I was in the Dundee area, it wouldn't just not be a priority for me. It wouldn't be of any interest to me. This is a West of Scotland problem. So when you focus it down into the West of Scotland and you talk about 43% of our young offenders having consumed this drink, it becomes a very much a minority pursuit, but a very significant one for the communities in the West of Scotland whose safety needs to be protected from this particular Okay. Following on from that then, in, in paragraph uh, 18 of the FM, it says it might therefore be anticipated that financial savings to the police, justice, prisons and health budgets uh, will be realised as a result of moving such drinks from sale. Um, so, although, are, are you arguing that there's, although there's a very small, relatively small percentage of alcohol sold has the caffeine in it, potentially it's, it's causing quite a lot of disruption and a lot of work for the police, justice, prisons, etc., and therefore that's where the savings would come I, in. I couldn't have put it better myself. Okay, that's great. I mean, w with, with something like the police, you know, I mean, if, if, if they had a little bit less of that problem to deal with, they'll just deal with something else, won't they? I mean, they wouldn't actually, you wouldn't actually make police officer redundant or anything, would you? Well, Mr Mason, I, I, I'm sure this committee doesn't have the time to go into a debate about a 40% reduction in crime and the highest number of police that we've ever had. But it is an interesting debate to be had. I think you're absolutely right. The, the use of police time would become more efficient. It wouldn't actually change uh, the police. So you, I, I, I entirely concur with you on that. Okay. If I could also follow up, uh, the convener asked you about this whole thing about the 18, uh, you know, no discrimination on age for adults uh, between 18 and 21 and so on. I, mean, I think he made the point that it did seem to be going in slightly a different direction because I have to say I'm very sympathetic on the whole to, to where all this is going. Um, but, I mean, if it did go in the other direction, it made it a bit easier for 18, 19 and 20-year-olds to get alcohol or even people who are younger. I mean, that, that would kind of add on some of these costs again to the police and health and everything else that you're trying to save elsewhere, would it not? 
would, if it, if it was to occur. It was really very interesting, the evidence given by Tim Ross from, uh, I think it's South Ayrshire or East Ayrshire, uh, ADP the other day, who is himself uh, police. And he actually said that uh, he didn't think that this would occur at all. He thought that they, the, uh, the fact that there would continue to be voluntary license, licensees who'd want to restrict it on occasion was fine. But to actually say that, certain, that some 18, 19 and 20 year olds uh, are cause drink problems ones of 21, 22, 23, 24 also cause those problems. So having an age discrimination when alcohol is a legal drink at 18 is not appropriate. This is a principled element within the bill, and you're quite right, it is totally different to the other sectors. It does stand out as being quite different. Uh, if, if, if I had any evidence that actually uh, 18 to 21 year olds were largely responsible for the mayhem in some of our uh, city centres, then I would... Uh, I would agree with you, but actually with the levels of youth unemployment and the, the reduced uh, wages that they receive as apprentices and uh, reduced minimum wage for this group, this is not the group. It's the 21 to 25 year olds who are in employment, who have high levels of employment, who tend to be causing uh, drunken mayhem in the centre of our cities. Thank you. Um, I mean, you did mention in your answers, and it's also in uh, one of the responses from Aberdeenshire Council about uh, whether or not a community council is active or not. And I have to say, I was a little bit puzzled by Aberdeenshire Council's comment, uh, because, as I understand it, in Glasgow, they have a clear list of which community councils are active and which are inactive. So there's really not any work there, and there's not any cost for the council. The council could tell us that this afternoon if we asked them. So, I mean, are you aware of a problem around this, or what are Aberdeenshire I, meaning? I wasn't. I was quite surprised at that evidence, and I would have thought that it would, uh, it would be a duty on a council to know which community councils were active and which were inactive. Because in the areas that are inactive, they would need to carry out consultation, for example, on health and social care integration, where they're presumably talking to their community councils as part of, uh, as part of the consultation process. Any major change by the NHS requires to be consulted, so they need to consult their communities. They need to have a different mechanism for this. So they, they should know which of the which are the 15% of community councils that are in inactive in their area. There's, it's approximately 225, I think, across Scotland are inactive. So it's not an insignificant number. Uh, but because they're in deprived areas, um, you know, I think... A number of them are in my constituency. Ah. Uh, not all of them, but uh, <laughs> quite a few. And I, mean, I think there is a question between a, a, a kind of what's technically an active community council, which may be pretty sleepy and not do a lot, and one which is highly active, both of which I see. But I don't think that's the distinction we're, we're trying to draw here, is it? Really? No, it's no. not. I felt it was... I, I did look at that and say, you know, did they respond to new licence applications by even one line? I thought of looking at that, but really it was, it was, it was too complicated. There are, I think, about 1,300, 1,400 community councils, and to start doing that was really a, a, a mammoth task. If the community council chooses to be inactive, hopefully their members will be replaced in due course by more active members. But that's a matter for that community. At least there is a community council. Right, thank you. And my final point, and uh, maybe I didn't quite understand this properly because Mr MacDonald did question already about the, some of the police comments, but one of the points the police seemed to make was that um, if payments were going to be made to the local authority, that was different from the current ASB tickets that would be paid to the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service. Could you just clarify it f for me if you think there's a problem in there? I'm not sure of that. That's under the penalty notices under the... Yes, it was in our briefing. I haven't quite got the Police Scotland paper. I also, also note that Bill makes reference in paragraphs 2C and 3 of the schedule that payments are made to the local authority. And then it says this is a departure from the current ASB tickets. Sorry, this has caused confusion. It's an alphabetical order, but it's still causing confusion. Oh, yes, here we are. I mean, at the moment, there are fixed penalty notices issued, and it, the alcohol awareness training is merely a diversion of that. So I'm not quite sure... Yes, it was in the, it's actually in the first page of the Police Scotland, uh, which is page 24 of the committee briefings. I don't know if you've got that. Um, no. but, but their problem is, is who you're paying, who, who's, who's actually being paid. It's yeah, that kind of technical the, side of it. Yeah, there is, there, is, there is quite a complicated system in penalties, uh, which uh, I have to say 
I am not fully up on, um, and, and I, I'll need to take it away, I think, and, and respond to you in writing on that, uh, Mr. Mason, uh, if that's okay, convener. Uh, I mean, the situation is, at the moment, court penalties are interesting because court penalties, some money is retained by the courts, but some goes back to the UK Treasury. If it's a local authority fee, of course, the local, a penalty, then the local authority keeps that money. So there are, there are, different, there are differences there which uh, our colleagues on the Scotland Bill might want to look at because you know, retaining that money, if we find our people in Scotland retaining it here um, to a greater extent might be something that's uh, uh, worth pursuing. But I, I, I will look at the official record and, and, and detail of your question and get back to you as soon as possible on that's that. That's great. Thanks so much. Cheers. Okay, thank you very much. That appears to have concluded questions from committee members, but I still have uh, uh, one or two points I want to raise with you. Uh, Richard, I mean, every week we get uh, government bills and uh, the financial memoranda, and uh, one of the things that um, has been drawn to our attention is the issue of best estimates. I mean, as you know, the financial memorandum, and it says right at the start of your own FM, has to satisfy Rule 9.3.2 of the Parliament's standing orders, but... But, uh, but in your own financial memorandum, you've, you've said things like, um, uh, in terms of estimating financial impacts, no attempts have been made to investigate the methodologies or data used in the studies referred to. Where conclusions reached attempt to place a figure on savings might be achieved, they should nonetheless be regarded as speculative. Uh, you use uh, phrases like working assumption, uh, you know, the uh, issue of degree of accuracy has been raised. Witnesses have talked about not enough detail in actual costings, understated, um, not properly thought through, unquantifiable. Uh, the police, uh, which was just referred to there, said there may be significant additional costs not incorporated in a financial memorandum. And 9.3.2 requires a financial memorandum to distinguish uh, between the costs of local authorities as opposed to others, and yet you've lumped them in in terms of this table, which two other members have already touched on. So do, are you suggesting that, you know, that um, the standing order uh, 9.3.2 has actually been met? Because I don't really believe that we have best estimates here in terms of this table. We've got an SMS estimates few, and we've got assertions that there's going to be significant savings. I think a lot of us are sympathetic to the overall policy objective and that that might be achieved. But all the evidence that we're receiving seems to suggest that there are, that there are no best estimates that have been provided. Well, I hope that I've been able to answer some of the specific evidence which you received, which I believe to be fallacious. Uh, I believe that they've been overestimated. For example, the advertising industry clearly has a vested interest in not reducing their advertising, and their costings, frankly, were wildly inaccurate. And there have been others which have been, uh, you know, considerably excessive. The thing about, the, I don't want to go over them all again, but the thing about reissuing the licenses, for example, which would be a significant cost, uh, instead of sending out a one-page amendment as part of a general mail shot, you know, the costs involved in that is a single sheet of paper with the additional amount you know, so suggest that there are high costs in that. So there are, there are quite a lot of things in there. Uh, there's stuff on the GP notification, for example, where the two vested interests, the court and the GPs, have both suggested high levels of costs, which I simply don't accept. But what I do accept, and, and I think the committee questioning has, has correctly drawn out, is that some of this stuff is really quite innovative. It, it is quite innovative. And when something's innovative, it is actually difficult. To, to make an, uh, a proper quantification, we we have done we've done our level best within the the available methodologies to provide to, to provide these costs. I think the one other point I'd make, uh, convener, is this: that certainly we have not divided it into, for example, local authority, NHS, police, etc. Uh, because one of the problems is that we are trying to address this on the basis of breaking down the silos within these individual budgets. One of the greatest problems we've faced as a parliament is that is encouraging someone to make a saving in one area when the savings actually, sorry, carry out expenditure in one area when the savings actually accrue in another area. Uh, and that's one of the problems here. So it is really difficult to break that down into the individual sections uh, that, the, that the standing orders do require. We've done our best, and I did answer, I think, the major question uh, from Ga Gavin Brown about the local authority costs, and I think that's related to the ADPs and alcohol awareness training. And that's a significant proportion of the annual costs uh, that we've put against the, the, the various groups. Uh, so uh, 
Uh, and I think my final comment was, in terms of the overall alcohol effect in Scotland of 4.3 billion, the total expenditure on this bill, even if you take the upper range, even if you take the fact that we, we, we've tried to be very straightforward about the upper range on these costs, the, co the costs of the, all the 10 measures in this bill are a mere fraction of the cost to Scottish society of the alcohol problems. And if we can save a few percentage points on those problems, it will more than pay for itself. Indeed, but it's just that, you know, when we have ministers and bill teams here, we, we press them on best estimates quite severely. And you probably know that uh, on a number of times we've actually suggested, you know, that supplementary financial memorandum could, could, should be brought forward to try and fill in some of these gaps. And I don't really think it's appropriate to come with significant unquantified, 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 and all this stuff in 42. I mean, we should really have best estimates and we should be able to um, surely in any bill, whether it's a member's bill or a government bill, have some kind of detail that go on that. Um, I think everyone should be held to the same standard in terms of a piece of legislation. So I'm not saying anything to you I wouldn't be saying and have said on a number of occasions to ministers. I, I, I appreciate that and <coughs> I, I do understand. I mean, the resources available to us in the Parliament for private members bill is considerably limited compared to the government. Uh, but having said that, um, we have tried to distinguish between where, where we can work out the costs and, and in the areas where we're saying, for example, some but unquantified, we're not trying to deny that there will be some costs, but we're not talking about significant amounts here. Uh, it, you know, it's, it, 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 it means it's difficult to quantify, but if we were talking about millions of pounds or even tens of thousands of pounds, then I think you know, the committee would be quite right to say that this is not, not adequate, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about relatively small expenditure here. Uh, and that's not just in relation to the overall costs, that's in, in relation to the actual costs of the effect. Can I give you just two examples to illustrate this? Multi-pack discounting, the costs on local authorities minimal. Now, they are already inspecting on the question of volume discounting. This parliament passed a law in which its clear intention was that there should not be sales on a basis of discounting for volume. The supermarkets have chosen quite legally, and I want to stress that, totally legally, to sell multi-packs of beer at, at, at volume discounted prices. They have chosen to get round the wishes of this parliament, and they, they're perfectly entitled to do so. Whether morally and ethically they're entitled to do so, frankly, is another question. All that we're trying to do in this bill will be to actually ensure that on, on, uh, on the multi-packs that we tighten that as far as we can within reason because we're not asking them to look at every single container. That would, be, that would be too difficult. We're asking them to be a bit more restrained in what they're doing. Now, there will be costs involved in that because they will be having to inspect the beer trays as well as the wine and the spirit trays. But the additional costs of looking at that in a supermarket will be minimal. Supplementary from Mark, and then I'll allow you to have the, the last word to Richard. Yes, Commissioner. It's just you just said there, Dr. Simpson, about the um, the where you've not quantified costs. You don't expect these to be high. But when I asked you about the fact that you distinguished, un, you've got minimal, unquantified, some but unquantified, significant but unquantified. You suggested that they were basically you could put them on a kind of uh, a sort of sliding scale from minimal up to significant but unquantified. So presumably where you're saying things like some but unquantified, we're not talking about trifling sums there. Um, we're talking probably, what, six-figure sums? Uh, ballpark? What six figures is that? That's 10,000, is it? No, it would be about 100,000 100, upwards. No, no, no. So we're, no, not, we're talking not talking about that. that. We're not talking about okay. that. Can I just uh, correct one thing, if I may, Mr. MacDonald? The significant but unquantified only refers to savings. Indeed, but so it there also are no significant but, but unquantified yep. costs. But, but, it, but indeed, there are some unquantified. But it all adds up to the bigger picture of I understand best that. estimates, and I understand you know, that. seeing something is minimal, and then seeing something is unquantified, and then seeing some but unquantified. I guess from the committee's perspective, we would want to have a rough idea of what kind of ballpark you're talking in there. And that would give us some indication of, of where costs were likely to fall, because at the moment it's it's down essentially to our guesswork as to okay. what is meant by the, the the differentiation between those terms. Uh, can I can I respectfully suggest that as this is a summary, 
that when the co committee is considering its report, it does go back and look at the individual sections to, to, in to which does, it does, as far as we have been able to do, indicate that there are, where there are some cost, costs, uh, and we've indicated sometimes a range of these costs, we haven't been able to quantify them as exactly as we would like. Uh, I mean, to take, uh, um, uh, take uh, um, another example, the costs on local authorities of restrictions on advertising, well, do they police the current voluntary ban? We don't know. So we've not been able to quantify whether extending that from 100 metres to 200 metres will involve costs at all. I mean, if they're walking 100 metres in every direction from a school at the moment to check this voluntary ban... Uh, without any prospect of an income from a, from, a, from a penalty notice, then extending it to 200 metres but having a penalty notice may actually produce a benefit. It may actually produce if we, a positive sum. If we look at the one area where you've provided a sort of a range of estimates, and that's the potential savings on multi-pack discounting, you've provided us with a range of estimates there which go from 0.6 million to 1.74 million, so almost a threefold um, potential uh, in yes. increase. Um, presumably you could have done that for some of these other ones which you haven't provided any information for. You could have given us that that range of estimates from a sort of an expected minimum to an expected maximum and that would have been I think more than what we've got in the table. If I could I would. If we could if we, we would have provided more detailed estimates. The particular one you've mentioned is because we have the Sheffield report we know that the effect of the discounting ban, as it has been implemented in Scotland, has been 2.6% reduction in consumption, as against 3.1% expected reduction. Therefore, we know that the amount of the additional reduction that could occur uh, could be as much as 1.74 million. The reason why there's a lower estimate on that is because I fully expect the industry, I'm afraid, to get around this in some way. They will, they will either sell, as some of the evidence that's been given to you, they will either stop selling the low multi-pack of four and they will only sell the top selling multi-pack, which they will be able to do at, at a volume discounted price on where it is being sold elsewhere, but not within the store. So I think that is actually a very good illustration of the problem of giving us a narrow range on some of these things. But the, the, the ones where it's some but unquantified, we're not talking about 100,000. I do want to stress that. We're talking about five-figure sums rather than six-figure sums in most cases. But if you look at the, the detail, and I would you know, hope that the, 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 the support staff will be able to do that in, in drawing up your report, you'll see that we've actually endeavoured to, 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 to talk about what we're, you know, in more detail about what we're actually talking about. But okay. we didn't want in the summary to mislead by giving figures which were, you know, were spurious. And some of them are really very difficult because they're, it's quite innovative stuff and costing it is why we're having pilots. Okay. okay. Right. That's finished questions from myself and the committee. Is there any brief final point you want to make, Richard, before we wind up? Session? No, I think, I think I just want to re-emphasize that notwithstanding the entirely appropriate comments, convener, that you've been making about the difficulties we've had in the costings here, that the big picture is that if you take the, the, if you take the medium to long-term situation, I am confident that these measures will contribute uh, to and complement the government's efforts in terms of reducing our, uh, uh, our undue attachment to alcohol in an inappropriate way. We're on a good path. We've been on a good path since 2005. That path needs to be maintained. Price and availability are two of the big things, but also, and the main purpose of this bill is to tackle those who are beginning to get into difficulty, not those who are dependent, who will undoubtedly be affected by minimum unit pricing. And I want to put that on the record. I have always accepted that those who are harmful drinkers, who are dependent alcoholics, will undoubtedly be helped by minimum unit pricing. But whether it will help those who are hazardous drinkers before they move to that is another matter. This bill will help to underpin the government's efforts and complement them, and the cost of this bill will actually be a mere fraction of the ultimate savings and goal that we all want to achieve. OK, well, thank you very much for that. Um, this being the, um, the end of our public session, I'd now like to uh, close this to the public and uh, official report, and we'll call a recess to 11.30.